Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and I am here with my co-host, Matt Scott. Hello. And we are very fortunate today to have one of the OGs of overlanding in North America and a close personal friend, Paul May. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, man. Oh, it's my pleasure. My honor. Thank okay. you for having me in. Well, and you were telling Matt and I that you've actually listened to all of the podcasts. The whole kit and caboodle. So, so what are some things that you think we could do better about um, the podcast? I think you guys are spot on. I think you're doing an awesome job. And the, Particularly the, me. I'm really good, right? <laughs> when you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, Matt has lots of cool things to do, and oh, the podcast plenty, is just one of them. He's got so. plenty of on his plate. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure of it. Um, exactly. Things. What I, I really enjoyed about it, and it, it, maybe it's a, uh, I don't know, I don't know how to say it, but it's all these people that I, yeah. I have met and that are friends of mine that are, you guys have interviewed. And I'm yeah, I, I know where he's yeah. coming from. And, you know, I picture their face sitting right here. And it's yeah. been a wonderful experience. For and me now you're today. sitting right yeah, here in this hallowed seat. <laughs> well, you're not on the podcast just because you're our buddy, but it is because you have lived a, a very interesting life and you have traveled extensively yourself, including probably a dozen trips by now to Africa, if not close to that. Yeah, getting close. Yeah. yeah and... And you've traveled a lot also in North America. You've owned a lot of different land cruisers. So I, I'd love to just let this conversation flow through some of where you've come from. Mm-hmm. And then those little nuggets of, of those gems of experience that you've had along, along the way with your journeys. So may, maybe just give us like the, where did, where did Paul come from? Yeah. Who is Paul? Who is Paul May? Um, it's been a wonderful life. I'm very fortunate. Uh, my parents uh, were all for travel, and I grew up in uh, traveling in travel trailers of all things. Yeah. And uh, we had an Aristocat. It was a single axle. Oh. Uh, ran around in that in the early 70s. In the, uh, in the mid to late 70s, we had a, a double axle prowler, and we went all over the place in that. And um, I also was involved in a lot of early activities with the scouts, and we got out a bunch in there. So uh, in 75, my parents took me on a, a month long around the country tour. We left wow. and I was in the, in the back seat of the Ford country squire and we went from <laughs> country was, squire. Yeah, That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and it was, a, it was a bad country squire. I mean, it was mean. I mean, like my, my dad had uh, fly by all the guys in the pickups with their trailers. He just hauling it past the guys and he just wave and smile. Yeah. yeah, it was a pretty impressive car. But we did a, a trip from Salt Lake to uh, Albuquerque, to Texas, to Florida, to New York City, to Chicago and back. Yeah. And I mean, all around the country. And it just opens your eyes to there's a different world, right? Especially at, at 10 years old. And when, uh, when I was in that, uh, that early time frame, I also uh, started. Uh, getting into the outdoors, um, scouting was a big thing. And so all my friends were getting their trains and their Hot Wheels and mm. all those things. And for Christmas, I'm getting a, a Kirkham's uh, backpacking tent and a down sleeping bag. And, the, you know, and the, the uh, my, there we go. And, you know, the hard frame uh, backpack and all this stuff to go camping and getting out. And when I was 12, we did a 60-mile backpacking trip for eight days and hiked from Utah through Kings Peak and out, uh, from Wyoming to Kings Peak and out into Utah. And that hooked me on the, on the outdoors part of that. So from there, man, boy, any time that I could get away. I mean, I, I drove when I was 16. I took off in, uh, in the car I had at that time and uh, slept in the front seat of the car in in Newport Beach. Oh, know? sweet, sweet. <laughs> ran and off. at sixteen, that's le- that's legit. Yeah, at sixteen. Yeah, you ran off and did that. That's so, something that you can only do at sixteen. Yeah. And I, I, yeah. Well, at twenty two as well. I, I yeah. slept in the front seat of my two thousand two TII in Sausalito <laughs> for a couple of days, and so we were yeah. getting out and doing that stuff. I um, bet you wish you still had that car. Whew. Yeah, like yeah. those two thousand twos have just gone through the roof in the last five years. Yeah, I used to I used to drag race muscle cars on State Street in Salt Lake City back <laughs> in the day. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, and uh, so yeah, a lot of a uh, uh, wanderlust sure. uh, involved in that, uh, and that moved moved me into uh, traveling a little bit more for uh, just personal enjoyment. Uh, and every dime I made for after after 
after college and getting up through all that stuff I spent on traveling the Southwest and getting out and doing more and more and more. And it was a lot of fun. I, I had a blast with it. And, uh, you know, that all who wander are not lost kind of thing. Yeah. That was, that was my mantra for a long time. Um, got into, uh, into vehicles, um, trucks started out with a, uh, 67 scout right hand drive male Jeep. That was, uh, that was <laughs> the cool. kind of awesome. skateboard mobile in, in college. Went to a CJ three, a, a Willie's so you had, a Oh yeah. Place, yeah. Right? yeah, it was a C CJ three, a, um, 40 was the top speed in the thing, but it'd climb a tree. Sure. Sure. Right? So we'd flat tow that down to Moab and, yeah, I've been Moab. I've been wanting to buy a CJ two A or CJ three A for a very long time. I want a yeah. CJ five. I don't know why. I can't yeah. explain it. It's a V eight in them. I think. So. Yeah, <laughs> I can explain it. I can do a lot. Yeah, for you can get it. a three hundred four in it. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, so I had had that three A, and then a, a friend of mine um, was uh, deeply involved and still is with Land Rover in Utah. Excuse me. And so I I got into I had a uh, a series uh, series three eighty eight. That we've put a full Defender interior in it and rebuilt the engine in that. And then I had a Series 2A109 right-hand drive out of Wales uh, for a little while. Couldn't trust either of them out of the no. town. Yeah. Uh, but when you were driving around the town, you were awesome. It, uh, you were on there, Safari yeah. in Salt Lake. Yeah. yeah. It was. They were cool. I mean, yeah. very sexy. Cars. Super cool. Yeah. Very sexy vehicles. Did yours stop? Because my 109-2A did not stop. If you put your feet out on the ground. It yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was the most effective way to do it. Yeah, yeah, it went through a lot of sand. They had it. some kind of master cylinder that had like a, a little air pocket, and the factory prescribed method was to park the vehicle on a 45-degree slope <laughs> so you can bleed the brakes. So I'm like, like I'm going to do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just not going to have brakes. <laughs> I'll just you know, go slow and yeah. downshift. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. Your your Land Rover was awesome too, Matt. I remember that. Did it, wasn't it like from a game park somewhere or it, something? It was like imported from, I, I want to say, somewhere that was right-hand drive, so South Africa or, mm -hmm. or England. I was thinking South Africa based on the fact that there was no rust. And then it lived on a, uh, I think it was like out of, it was like the out of Africa game park in somewhere in texas oh that's right yeah. <laughs> that so you had that's right it. i remember it was yeah. the, bl the blue with the ralph, badging on it. ralph <laughs> ralph, the ralph the Land, yeah the land rover that thing was awesome though yeah. well mine wasn't so lucky it came out of wales and it was a uh, bucket of rust but it looked awesome so it broke the frame and so in, in in the capacity that i've known paul hmm. you have been fanatical about land cruisers yes is it this was it the 109's fault that you went Partially, to yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple things. One, um, the old vintage Rovers were a pretty snooty bunch. If you did anything outside of Rover, it was uh, it was. Yeah, it's, like it, it's still the it. it's still the same. Same way. Yeah, yeah. yeah if if you could if you put a tire wider than ten inches on a Land Rover, yeah, yeah you're excommunicated. You're out. Yeah, you're out. You're out. Well, see, I'm I'm uh, I love unicorns. Yeah. I, I like to see what people can do with them. And so I, I did. I hopped into, well, for necessity of something that reliable uh, that I could take out of town, I drive and wheel and come back and still be in the same truck. Uh, that was one reason. But uh, I also like, I like to see what people can do with them and modifying vehicles and, and such. Yeah. So, yeah, so I went through, I, I bought a, a second-gen 4Runner back in the, in the early 90s. Uh, proceeded to roll it to uh, two I remember weeks. that story. Yeah, I was up in uh, Snohomish Pass and hit black ice and did a 720 on the road and then um, a horizontal 720 off of the road, full on yard sale. Walked away with a scratch of my nose and the car was dented in every panel. Uh, and I was like, dang, these are pretty good cars. <laughs> I, went, I went right back to Salt Lake and bought me another one. Yeah, uh, yeah the car saved one. your life. Yeah, yeah. Walked Imagine if you had been in the Land Rover, I mean, or any oh. vintage vehicle when flat, that happened. Yeah, flat you, Paul. Yeah, you, yeah, they Paul would just, not be as tall. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's I would it. not be around, that's yeah. for sure. So, yeah, so it started in the, with the Forerunners as far as uh, that goes. And I've been through a couple different uh, pickups and, and other things. And uh, uh, from there, I ended up with, uh, with the 100 Series Land Cruiser. It was actually my wife's car uh, to start with because uh, I had another work truck and some other things going on there. And when we started up the... Uh, uh, started up equipped. Um, I told my wife, I need it. I need a truck to yeah. put all the stuff on. And she looked at me square in the eye and she says, I'm not driving a tank. <laughs> I want a car. And that was that. So yeah. She got a car and I, I got, a and tank you got a land cruiser. I got a tank <laughs> yeah. Yeah, out of it. So yeah. And then we've got a progression from there. So. Now on that, 
on that two on that 100 series Land Cruiser because that was the one that you had the longest mm-hmm. and I mean we did a bunch of traveling together in that yeah. and you even competed in um, valiantly in the expedition trophies of early days yeah. with that with that vehicle talk a little bit about what you really liked about what you did with the vehicle and then maybe some things that you wouldn't do again or that you found were were maybe shortcomings of the hundred. Um, the, the hundred was a, a beast of a vehicle and, and anything I threw at it, it just didn't seem to care. And I put more on it and more on it and more on it. And it had everything you can imagine. I was way over uh, GVWR on that thing. And it was a blast and yeah. I had a wonderful time and I didn't want to get rid of it. Uh, and, and so I, I think that what I did is I overbuilt it. Hmm. Um, there was just too many systems trying to come out of that one single vehicle. Now it's still running and still going and doing fine for the for the gentleman that has it now. Uh, I think that, that that was probably the one thing that I would say that I did is I, I overbuilt that truck. Yeah, the cruisers are so heavy and stout to begin with that you know I, they're easy to overbuild though. You know you kind of have to put a rear bumper on them kind of need some sliders you kind of need this and all of a sudden yeah. you've got an extra two three hundred pounds of just stuff bolted before you put the stuff in it yeah and i had a, um, a 45 gallon auxiliary tank so i was carrying 72 gallons on board that thing i could wow. drive to la and fill up and drive back yeah sure <laughs> there's no problem at all so i think the weight of of all that stuff um other than that, boy, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. A lot of it was uh, built by myself. I did a lot of things. My, guess, my first rack on there was an ATV ramp that I bolted together and put some, <laughs> some oddball stuff on there before we really got into the, uh, into the market of, of what we, we see today as the overlanding market. It was, you were on your own if you wanted a rack. There was, the yeah, there wasn't a whole lot. I mean, and I think, I think you and I first started talking probably around... 2004 or so does that sound right on the time frame Maybe yeah 2005, 2005 i think 2005 was, yeah, in the fall of five or early six yeah. yeah i i had been working with nathan hinman who was working on some of the easy on stuff and then i think you just called me up one day mm-hmm. and you're like hey i'm i'm paul may and i'm the guy who's bringing in all this cool easy on stuff and by the way, thanks for all of the photos and all of the coverage that you've been. I mean, you were just very gracious. I remember it was such a, it left an impression on me that first conversation. You were very gracious about it. You were, I remember you being very complimentary of Jess and his dad. And I mean, at the time, in fact, I think that that's how you connected with Easy On was that you, you met um, one of the stoolers on their way north, right? Yeah, yeah. That I, quite honestly, I where I am right now, it wouldn't have happened without my involvement with Land Cruisers. Quite honestly, it wouldn't have at all. Um, back in 2005, um, I was looking for a, a change in my life. I'd been working at the same company for going on 20, 20 years, and it was, it was time for me to do something different. And uh, Jack Stuler, uh, the he was a founder of Easy On. Uh, and he was on a trip. He was in his 60s, and uh, he was with his girlfriend, and they had put together a troopie and had driven it from Ushuaia, Ushuaia to Alaska. And uh, they came into Salt Lake, and I was in the presidency of our local Land Cruiser Club, and, and I invited him to stop and, and let us see. We, you, you never saw troopies. No. Yeah, right? you don't see. You didn't darn see. rare, especially 15 years ago. Totally. And so he stopped, and we, we kind of hit it off, and he uh, had all these interesting things on this truck I'd never seen before. And he showed me all of them. And he says, you know anybody be interested in, in bringing this stuff to the United States? And I started to say somebody else's name. And my wife punched me in the arm, looked at me like, you idiot. <laughs> yeah. It's you know, just, you. Yeah. There, there's that look. You yeah. get yeah. the look, right? <laughs> no words are said. So just give me that look. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. I am an idiot. <laughs> and I said, hey, can we talk about this tomorrow? And I spent a sleepless night, thought it over, and decided I'm going to start a company. And told Jack that the next day, and we met with the the whole land, land cruiser club. And um, I flew down to Houston when he was packing it up to leave. And I said, "I'm serious." Looked him in the eye, we shook hands, and that's the only deal we've made. Wow! And it's been a gentleman's agreement ever since. Uh, and uh, I I think the Stoolers, um, Jack and his son Jess, who Jess yeah. is running uh, Easy On now, true gentleman. 
Yeah, incredible far people. Far and above. Yeah, incredible. True gentlemen. Uh, gentlemen. And they are loyal and honorable men. And I'm, I'm privileged to be involved with that company. So we started out at that point. I started the company up, and our first show was, uh, was the uh, Easter Jeep Safari in 2006. And I show up with this truck and, and park it down in the middle of that, that booth area. Yeah. I'm right across from Casey Highlights, and there's sure. semi and all this stuff, yeah. right? And these guys are walking by with the, with the tank tops and the beers, and they're staring at my thing like I had a third head. Yeah. And they're like, what's that? I haven't seen anything like that. And I talked to the KC guys, and they're like, well, welcome to the Super Bowl, young man. Yeah. And I'm sitting <laughs> over there by myself, you know, like, hey, look at me. I'm, I'm cool. <laughs> and, yeah, it was a very interesting start. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that was kind of the start of the whole thing as we, yeah. we brought stuff in in early And now KC has roof tents on their vehicles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Life comes Life in full circle. Full circle on that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was a pretty interesting start, that's for sure. And yeah, my experience with the Stoolers have also been that. And in fact, I, I remember when we were preparing the Land Cruisers, um, well, we, we came into Africa and you were with me and Greg and, mm-hmm. and Kurt and the team from Expedition 7 in Africa. We did that whole trip together. We did Botswana and the Skeleton Coast, and that was just an, an incredible experience. And Jess and Jack let us just basically store those trucks in in their shop for a long time, mm-hmm. mon- months before we sent them off for Antarctica. On the E7 experience, what were some of the things um, that you noticed? Because sometimes I have trouble seeing the forest for the trees. But since you were involved with E7 for that one leg, what were some of the things that you took away from that? Things that maybe you recognized as that's a really good idea, or maybe that isn't such a good idea. What were some of the things, some of the takeaways that you had from Expedition 7? I think the biggest thing I took away was your philosophy on the builds on, on the troopies uh, out of that. And the, how you took, a, took great care to make sure that they were... Uh, they were light and nimble and functional, and you had a lot of capability that you probably would never use, yeah. but you had it. In case something happened, uh, you had an ability to take care of, of everybody in your crew if you lost one of them yeah. for some reason. And I thought that was, uh, that was pretty cool. I mean, it was a different take than I had taken on vehicles at that point. You know, I was throwing all the stuff out of my good. Of course, I'm in the market. Yeah, that's true. That's what I do. I sell stuff, so you show the stuff, right? And I still do, and I still have that stuff on there. But I thought it was a really good way of, of going about that. It's preservation of assets, and that's mm-hmm. one of the things you've taught me early on, too. Um, that one was really cool. Um, I also learned that th- there is a rev limiter on a 60 series or a 70 series Land Cruiser with a, a four speed in a, v- a V6. <laughs> Uh, when we were out in the in the oh yeah, uh, yeah. I got to ride with uh, the gentleman that yeah. was our scout. Yeah, that's right. Man, he he just just wrapped that thing out, banging and, off the rev limiter. Sausage right? flay. Yeah, sausage yeah, yeah. flay trip out out in the uh, in Skeleton Coast, and so I got to ride along with the guy figuring out where we're going. Yeah, and he was high marking this thing like a snowmobile. It was incredible. <laughs> he was so good. He was so good at it. Yeah, yeah, and, and it like didn't. And he had like a colostomy bag. It was just like the it, most unusual experience. I mean, he was just this ninja on the dunes. Yeah, but you know the yeah, and he just needed it. He needed his magic carpet. It was incredible how well yeah. he could drive. And we had these you know these fairly heavy trucks for what they but they yeah. they were underweight but still a heavy truck. Kind of lumbering behind, going across these things, and he's like, I was like hair on fire. I'm going, oh god, this is this is awesome. Yeah, and that was a lot of fun. First helicopter ride that I ever took in my life was on that trip up in the Okavango. Yeah, in the Delta there, and getting up in that glorified Volkswagen Beetle with a yeah an R44. Oh man, it's the most. It's the most deadly helicopter ever made. It was yeah. perfect. <laughs> it was perfect. <laughs> it was so, such an awesome feeling to be up and above that and see all that going on. Uh, yeah, the wildlife, right? Yeah, the wildlife was impressive. Uh, even out on the Skeleton Coast, the wildlife was impressive. Yeah, for sure. Four days out there by yourself in the dunes, and there's nobody. Yeah, we were it. Driving on, on ruby sand. I know, it was incredible. Seeing, the, seeing those ships locked in on, you know, Hundred meters or a thousand meters from yeah. from the coast, just um, things ingrained in my memory that I will never forget. Yeah, uh, thanks to you guys. So it was a wonderful trip. I it re- it really was such a great time. And I, I was I remember when we first started getting into the dunes, 
and those seventies were just struggling. We were, we weren't even a half a mile in and we weren't even in the big dunes yet. And these trucks were struggling. Well, those dunes are big. They're big. <laughs> They're really big. And, and I remember a couple, there was a couple members of the team that were, they were starting to get very nervous and like, we're never going to like, we haven't even made it a half a mile yet. And we've got to go hundreds of miles and I just kept saying, it's, we're going to find the right tire pressure. Yeah. We're going to find the right tire pressure. And we kept getting lower and lower. And I think we ended up running those trucks, as I recall, at about 10 PSI in the rear and about 12 PSI up front. Mm-hmm. And we, I did, we did lose some beads on the wheels, but it was the only way you could get them through. It was just very, very low pressures. So. Yeah, and, and good spotting on it. Yeah, and yeah. Good, we had great drivers and stuff like yeah. that. I mean, showed how amazing of a driver kurt is to haul that 79 filled with all that fuel and everything like it was just yeah he, and he does just you know it doesn't i haven't yet to find anything that affects kurt. yeah yeah he's on he's good with whatever yeah, he's no, okay. yeah that's cool we got to yeah, break the truck and you know in greenland okay oh, we can get out and fix that and yeah, totally. whatever it is kurt is is uh on Unswayed in his activities. That, that was cool. The other thing that I really remember is going down the dunes, okay? Mm-hmm. So sand can only effectively get to a 45-degree angle on the sand. But you'd, you'd lean over those sand dunes, and they would growl at you. You'd get the car, and you'd be like, <laughs> yeah. right in the sand, because there's so much air in those sand dunes because they've been blowing around. We're compressing that air out of them. And the, the growling that came out of these hills as you're going down, it was... And I've never, never heard that before. I've never experienced that in any other sand dunes. So in Peru, in the Gobi, in any other sand dunes, I've never experienced that growling effect. It was it was unnerving. It was like a lion growling. Yeah, right. you're going, <laughs> like, what, what, where, where's that? Where's See, that? you got to go back, man. <laughs> I got to go back. You got to go back. It was yeah. impressive. It was awesome. Wonderful time. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah, I think E7, we, we all, all three of us have been on that in various stages. I want to go back to Africa. Yes. You're talking about Africa, I'm just like, <laughs> nothing else matters anymore. <laughs> I don't care about Moab. I don't care about the Mojave Road. Take me back to Africa. Yeah, exactly. I've had some wonderful experiences over there, and I, I love going over there. And doing it's just stuff. not what people think it is, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, I, I feel like there's a, there's a strong apprehension. Like, I always get people that ask me, aren't you, aren't you worried about being there? I'm like... Well, if I went home to Chicago, I'd be a little bit... <laughs> Way more worried. <laughs> I'd be a little bit more worried than, you know, yeah. like the worst thing that's going to happen, you know, in Namibia is, you know, you're going to starve to death because there's no one there, which means <laughs> there's no one there to commit a crime. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, there's, I think, what, four or five cities in the United States that are more dangerous than... No question. Johannesburg. No question. You know, in the list of crime issues. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, there are issues. Johannesburg still sketches me out. Let, yeah. let, let's be straight. It but is. Then, but then I remember all, when you yeah. picked me up at the airport. You're yeah. like, we got to be careful driving at it. I'm like, we're on the highway. He's like, yeah, we got to be careful driving at night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. There are issues. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. There, are, there are certain issues, but there are issues everywhere. There yeah. are certain yeah. areas in Los Angeles I don't drive. Yeah. Uh, or Chicago or yeah. East St. Louis. Or, you know, you, you can pick them out and you just don't go there. Or if you do, you go with people. Well, and I was picking you up at the airport in a G wagon, and I'm like, "We're gonna just like, we're gonna stick to this one route." Yeah. <laughs> it was and like that it was, was like that was ten right o'clock right when COVID was starting to be a thing yeah, too. too. And I remember like, mm. I mean, it was like the last trip. Yeah, it was the last trip we were all on. Yeah. Dang, it was a while ago. Totally. What was your favorite trip in Africa? Even if it's you know, let's not assume that it's E7. What's been one of the most memorable adventures that you've had on that continent? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a couple. Okay. Uh, had a chance to go with Jack and Jess uh, out to uh, Kruger National Park uh, and, and travel all over that park. Also went with you and Bruce. We did. And did. we went up and did that uh, incredible trip with that Impala. Med- Medique, right? Yeah, I think it was in that, that Impala that ran into the side of the... Oh, yeah. With, and the that? wild dogs, yeah. yeah I wasn't... Was that wild. was... Matt. So Matt and I have been having a conversation about Africa, and I said, I said, Matt, I'm just telling you from my own screw up, do the morning game drives. <laughs> because I was the one guy who was like, oh, I'm going to sleep in this day. And Bruce and Paul and whoever else, I mean, maybe Jess, Jess was there, there yeah. too. They all go out, and, and Impala runs into the side of the game truck, like center punches it, <laughs> knocks itself out, and then a pack of wild dogs devour it right over 
the vehicle, like right next to the vehicle. Yeah, from me to you. It was like air-breathing piranha. I mean, they left like three bones out of this poor little animal. And you're looking at it. You've got your camera in your hand. And you're like, I, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And <laughs> all of a sudden, it's all gone. Of and off they go. And I was like, good God, crazy stuff. That so, was wild. <laughs> yeah, and I missed that one. Yeah. I missed it. That's what I told Matt. I'm like, Matt, I missed the coolest thing. <laughs> I've got 100 days until Tanzania. So. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was a good one. I uh, had to get uh, um, Kalahati on the other side. Oh, uh, sure. And just below um, Namibia. Uh, beautiful place. Lots of animals that side. But the one, it's it going to sound funny, the, the most memorable trip that I've had over there, I went with Heather mm. on. And it was more of a cruise, a uh, uh, touring mm. uh, thing. We, we took, uh, we flew down to uh port elizabeth on the southeast coast and uh we were rented a mercedes and they decided to upgrade us to a jeep grand cherokee i was less than excited about that whole <laughs> yeah, thing. Like, come on really this is <laughs> 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 come on where's the merc i want, I want the, the merc, want the merc. Yeah. <laughs> want and, the jeep. and we did a uh a garden route the whole southern oh, yeah, coast that's beautiful uh, and went to the national parks and rented one of their cottages in the national parks and saw that all happen we bungee jumped off the highest bungee jump on the planet it was 670 foot crevasse that we jumped off a perfectly good bridge by our ankles uh and did that that was how did that, that feel good. um fun did you <laughs> feel a... noodly afterwards like did it like kind of i imagine you get a great back crack <laughs> <laughs> what they did is they lined you up by size well guess where i was right Huh. So I got to watch all of the people in front of me <laughs> lined up there. And the first ones, uh, the gals were a little bit uh, scared. And so what they do is they touch you all over. Like Heather was up there getting ready, and she was getting all nerved out. And so they were checking things, you know, and they, they kept her mind busy. And so she's watching them check them all, you know, check all over. Yeah. And, and they said, okay, we're going to count to three, and you're going to go, one, two, three. Ah! <laughs> That's all I heard was, ah! <laughs> there goes my wife. <laughs> off the thing and then she comes back they go grab you with a winch it's a uh, like a high speed like a uh, one of the old 82 74 winch yeah, yeah. right they drop a guy down on a cable hook you on and winch you back up to the bridge and then i did the jump and i was the heavy guy i think i went the furthest i mean there there's enough time to scream twice you know if you want to breathe <laughs> in and scream again go, oh, yeah, go ahead wow and it was uh, it was a lot of fun and all the teeming impressive. crocodiles down you know right <laughs> no well luckily, hopefully no, but, um, <laughs> we were about a uh, ways up from the from the bottom there but Got it was a, a quite a good jump and we went from there ended up south of cape town and went out um with the sharks went out oh, on the wow. boat and went uh, swimming with the sharks for a while in the cages oh. off of that great whites uh, yeah. Oh, incredible. How yeah. was that? Uh, cool. All sorts of cool. Now, are you are you on like a, a rebreather or, or, or a, what is it, I don't know, a regulator to a, a line to the boat? Or you have your own tank on? Or how are you staying on? So what they did, they set it up as cages off the side of the boat. And so the cages were going down about six feet in depth. And they had about two feet of, of air above. So, and we all had tanks and we were all in the gear. And so you'd climb into the cage and the, the sharks were out and about, so you could you could get your breather and go down under the water and be like me to you from these these uh, great whites that were swimming around wow. wide in that area. And Did then, they care about you? Were they trying to eat you? No, they they I th you know they swim by the one eye. <laughs> like, check, stick check your, you stick out. your hand out, please. <laughs> Don't stick your hands out of this place. Um, so they it. they really honestly didn't care, give a crap about us being there. But uh, it was really interesting. We got to see some of them. Gads, one of them. Was about half the length of the boat. I bet wow. it was like close to twenty feet. Wow, 15, 20 feet long. Wow, uh, and videos of the whole thing, and we did that. That was kind of cool. Super uh, cool. Jumped off Lion Head on a parasail and did all sorts of fun things that were just more of a of an adventure for us in a personal sense than driving off in trucks and going R R R. This is yeah, really cool. sure. We're we're in the middle of nowhere. Um, but I love that, but I also love just going in and and for the sheer adventure of being in a new place and finding new things. So, yeah, it's both both sides of that. Oh, no question. Yeah, you got to have the full spectrum. It's like Matt and I have talked many times about like, how do we get beyond the truck? And maybe that's a mountain bike. Maybe it's hiking. Maybe it's that you just want to go to that beautiful winery at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Or you're like, you're talk, you talked about doing a bourbon tour coming up or oh, something yeah. like that. Yeah. I, I think including those, those other elements is so important. So to yeah. the trip. Just, yeah. You know, Feed in other things as you can because the people that are there know what's going on. So not all of those uh, little touristy things are bad. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of fun. Hmm. 
What, what, any I'm just questions? thinking about about wine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Planning a trip around wine at this point. Just a ro- like a rosé tour. A rosé tour of of Provence, but we can call it overlanding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow yeah. overlanding in your nine. Oh well, yeah, I'm overlanding. <laughs> it's a pretty uh, empty term at this point. Anyway. <laughs> So didn't say that a lot. Yeah, it, yeah, I mean, it, it's now up to completely up to interpretation. <laughs> Adventure so, vehicle travel, right? Is that what we're talking? Adventure about? vehicle travel. Yeah. yeah. So if, yeah. if that you know that Porsche is adventurous, how about it? That's right. Yeah, you could it could be a Porsche from Rosé Winery to Rosé Winery in the south. Of you know that would be a really <laughs> great idea, except I wouldn't really make it past the first one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, it could be an issue. So you have a 200 series now, mm-hmm. and do. you like it. I love that truck. It's kind of yeah. like... It's my baby. It's your baby. Second baby, though. Um, yeah, I do. We, we took the 100 series uh, as far as I think it could, could go. Uh, we were one of the first people to, to really build up a 100 series, and so there was a lot of folks that looked at that. We uh, traded it in for a 5th Gen 4 runner, uh, 2013 Trail Edition. I remember Built. that one. That's when you were in Prescott. Yeah. Yeah, we bought that and built that up, and uh, Clay and his crew uh, took that as an impetus to start their Forerunners, too. They looked at a lot what we did with that Forerunner and said, hey, man, this is a great platform. It was cool. <laughs> Wonderful truck. Did anything I asked. I remember you saying that uh, in, in, in Dimensions, it was very similar to a 100 series. Very much so. Even though it looked slightly smaller than a, than a 100 I, yeah. I, that, that's something that's always kind of stuck with me. A uh, very capable truck. It hauled our, my little AT chaser around better than the, than the 100 did uh, with, the, with the V6. Um, the one thing I kept on telling everybody is it's, uh, the reason why I like it more than the 100 is because it was lighter. Yeah. But the worst thing about it is that it was lighter. <laughs> yeah. Felt lighter, uh, huh? Yeah. Lighter. The, the metal's a little bit lighter. All, of, all the things about it made it a more efficient vehicle. Yeah. Right, and so it, it outperformed the hundred. No, no question there. But it was, um, it, I missed my hundred. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I missed my hundred, and so we we ended up getting a, a white twenty thirteen two hundred series, and uh, that that vehicle I I haven't found an equal in my in my eyes. There's there's not an equal to that vehicle. Yeah, and and just this morning we went out and did a nice video shoot on that. So mm-hmm. all those that are listening, you'll see that come up on the YouTube channel, expeditionportal.com or Expedition Portal on YouTube, you'll see that come up soon. But what I really noticed in this particular build, having seen so many of your projects, is that it, this really is like the full culmination of your experience as a traveler and as a vehicle builder. And it's just a really thoughtful, thoughtful truck. Thank you. And what are the things that you like most about this one? The modification, what are the couple modifications that you've done that you most liked about you know, the, or that you most appreciate? Well, to start out with good tires and suspension. Um, I keep to try, I try my best to keep it as simple as possible and most um, I don't know, durable as possible. Uh, the, the ones that I really like, the, the, the work that Goose Gear did on the interior back when, when Goose Gear had time to do things, uh, they're very busy now. Uh, but I had a custom Goose Gear built out in the in- inside equaled the weight that I took out of it of seats, put it back in there with a lot more uh, functionality. Um, now I can sleep in that vehicle. Uh, when I run by myself, I scoot the passenger seat forward and tilt it forward, and I've got six foot seven inside. Wow. Um, so I throw a thermo rest down and sleeping bag, and just like the E7 trucks, mm-hmm. like I'm getting full circle here, like the E7s, sleep inside. You've got a lot of visibility, a lot of protection. You can mm-hmm. get out of something fast if you need to, if, especially if you're solo. Yeah. Uh, that works out really well. Uh, one of the other things that I figured out, and it, it didn't take long, is on a trip to Australia, I looked around looking for roof racks, and there aren't any roof racks on vehicles. That are, they're all running uh, load bars. And the reason yeah. why is because of the weight restrictions on the vehicles, right? So guys are trying to run light. Mm-hmm. So all those load bars, instead of racks, is saving weight. Load bars are working just as fine under a, roof, a hard shell or a soft shell rooftop tent. And yeah. It's redundant to have a rack underneath that, that scenario. So I'm running load bars on mine instead of a full rack. That I noticed that, weight. yeah. Um, just about all the weight in that vehicle is below waist high in my vehicle. That's cool. Uh, well, I was watching it on the trail today. I mean, we went through that very crossed axle downhill obstacle and – the vehicle was very settled, even with a roof tent and a awning up top, and all the the vehicle was really 
the, you know, the, the F two fifty tremor that I was driving was like dancing rear wheels. Like, well, let me, <laughs> let me wheel lift to this, to the moon on this side and then wheel lift to the moon on the other side. And yours, your truck was totally stable. Flexi down. Yeah. yeah. There's, I mean, above, above chest high in that vehicle, there's maybe 350 pounds. Yeah. That includes the roof of the vehicle. Yeah. So there's not a lot of weight in relative terms to the rest of the vehicle. Yeah. Above waist high on that. So it's a, it's a good fit. Uh, and, uh, yeah. I, Is there anything you'd do different with that truck if you were to build it again? Something that you'd leave out or, do, or use a different solution for? No. Cool. I, not one thing. Uh, in the older vehicles, uh, I did a lot of electrical built up all sorts of systems and relays and switches and doodads and bells and all this stuff. Yeah. I'm down to a six circuit, uh, blue C fuse block. I didn't need all of that stuff. And now with led lights, you don't need all the relays. You don't need all that stuff. You yeah. can run it. You, you have all the direct. switch pro switch S pod trigger things. You can, and, yeah. but I don't, you don't even and have I to. don't even have to, you don't have to do any of that. If you're into that. Awesome. But yeah. what I found is that when I built it in there, I never used it. Yeah. Uh, the 100 Series had a hot water system in it. I had a hot water heat shower system <laughs> built into the thing. It was like a $2,000 gizmo I used twice. Yeah. Ugh, come on. You know, that's a lot of weight and a lot of unnecessary stuff. So we've really tapered it all down and, and blended it all out. And this is the umpteenth build on a truck. So I've, I've got it down to what I want, and that's fine with me. I'm good with that. I've definitely found that as I build more vehicles, less is more. You know, like I, I, with my Gladiator, I tried to make it a little sailboat, and I now kind of regret that because I have all this weight and all this complexity, and I'm like, well, I could have also just had a fan and a light in there and probably have been just as happy. <laughs> but yeah, Utah. Yeah. So you are from Utah, born and raised. Born and raised, yeah. So for those listeners who haven't been, What's the what's the one thing people should see in Utah? I I'd say just don't come. It's just, just, it's just I, I've heard it's really <laughs> bad and dangerous. <laughs> danger, <laughs> danger, <laughs> danger, super dangerous. No, it it uh, and I, Scott's alluded to this over the years, and I've heard him say it in quite a few places. He's been a lot of places. This guy, you know, this guy here. Yeah, he's been a lot. He's been a few, just a few, just a few. And uh, his favorite place is Southern Utah. Yeah, and I would agree a hundred percent. I know I've been traveling Southern Utah for going on 40 years yeah. and I have not seen it all. I know a couple of our friends have seen more. I've probably yeah. seen it all, but um, I have not seen it all. And it is just spectacular. There's nothing else that I have seen on the planet like it. Well, there's such diversity of terrain in Utah. You know, yeah. you have Alpine and then you have these like otherworldly rock eroded sculptures. Yeah. From, you know, from uh, the arches area with yeah. three national parks. Uh, within that range, uh, Bryce Canyon's amazing. Zion is amazing. Uh, the whole Escalante area is impressive. San Rafael Swell. I mean, I could go on for forever. And I, I've I've done a couple little seminars at some of the uh, events that we've done, where I'll sit down and for an hour I take out the the paper map, the Utah State official paper map, and I lay it out. And I start in the northwest corner of the state, and I go to the southeast corner, and I say, go here, see this. This is a great camp spot. Don't miss a burger at Ray's and Green River. Yeah. Go to oh, here. Oh, you took me to Ray's? Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. another place yeah. we've all been yeah. together is Ray's. Yeah. And you, you point out all the things, and you could spend, whew, I don't know, a couple months easily doing nothing but going on a route around the state. And it's life-changing for me. It, it, it's it's my life that's what i i really enjoy to do is yeah southern utah i'm a utah boy yeah it's through and through uh northern utah is beautiful there's a lot of alpine there but there's alpine in southern utah too we yeah. drive up to over ten thousand feet in southern utah and get way above tree line if you want to do that kind of stuff it's it's a lot of fun too uh, but there's so much area to cover and, and it's so away. accessible too i think that's like really the cool thing for people that are you know, considering planning a, a trip to Utah is that y there's not a lot of private land. So much of it is public. So much of it is accessible. Um, I mean, I love it there. Yeah, I do too. And so as far as one place to, to go. Do you guys ever find yourself, you're, you're in wherever, and you're like, that looks like Utah. Yeah, totally <laughs> yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. Except, except for there's so much of that in Utah. Yeah. I mean, the fact that you've got, you know, I mean, Canyonlands alone, 
Yeah. You could. It seems like you could spend a lifetime exploring that. Oh, and the backpacking options down there. Yeah, it's endless. Have you guys ever been to Cappadocia, Turkey? No. So you, yeah, you went there recently. Yeah. Well, it's the balloons few, there, right? Yeah, they do the hot air balloons. Yeah, like above the karst limestone. Right, yeah. and, and uh, it was kind of a crossroads between the east west and on the Silk Route, and kind of in that area, you know, coming down from uh, uh, from well, the crossing there in Turkey, uh, and. It's impressive. We went up and did the hot air balloons. I had a friend that was in the military over there, and so we went over and said hi, and he took us around there a little ways. But that whole area reminded me of Bryce with mm. different colors. Wow. Oh, and by the way, they made caves in Bryce. Yeah, sure. <laughs> right? But yeah, they had you know hundreds of years of people living in the caves in like Bryce Canyon, only white. Yeah, sure. But yeah, you go around the, the world, and you're like, yeah, that's like here, or that's like that. You assimilate it to home. Yeah, for sure. Oh, that's oh, that is such a cool experience. So I'd love to go to Cappadocia. That'd be awesome. Pretty slick. And then there's another kind of vehicle that you have a particular love for, and that's that Gen One Tundra. You are definitely a fan <laughs> of those things. I think it's the most underrated truck. To you, isn't it? 100%. I think I think you're right. I think, and it, it's almost like you don't want to ruin it by getting the word out there that they're still one of the best. I mean, it has the four seven. V8, which is one of the most reliable motors Toyota ever brought ever to the did, United yeah. States. And it's got plenty of power. And it's not as big as a full-size truck, but it's also not as compact as a Tacoma. You know, it, it is. You know, the, the Gen 3 Tacomas, um, the Gen 1 Tundra is about, I think, somewhere in the range of an inch wider mm. and an inch longer mm. than the Tacoma now. Yeah. Okay. But you've got a V8 in it, and uh, we uh, this one that we have we call it Sleepy. And, and that, it, that's the one that's supercharged. Yeah, we put a supercharger. Not on so it. sleepy. Um, Kurt uh, Williams, our good friend, um, he had, as far as we know, the last in-box on-the-shelf TRD supercharger in the United States, and uh, we put it on this truck. And another friend of mine installed it. He was a, the master tech instructor, uh, Will Carroll. Put oh it yeah, Will. Him. Yeah, he does amazing so, work. Uh, in, in genius, you know with a wrench so he put it on there so i knew it was all done right you know and that that thing moves <laughs> it now has the same horse and torque as my gen 3 tundra but it's the size of a tacoma we put airbags on it so i call it my <laughs> three-quarter ton v8 tacoma yeah sure right yeah. and but it has the ability to hold the weight more properly than the tacomas do and it has the power to handle all that stuff and yeah i think it's it's the most underrated truck there is i think there was a period in time when almost every mechanic that i knew drove a first gen tundra because they didn't want to have to work on anything <laughs> that's so so true yeah mechanics like, don't want to like work literally on their own look cars. in look in the back of of you know the car dealer or whatever you're going to see mechanics driving first gen tundras they just they, the only thing that wears break. out is the paint <laughs> yeah, true yeah. no they they do seem to all be yeah. losing their paint i think yeah. that was when they kind of were just switching to water-based paints they're starting kind of around to figure that area, out. like late '90s, early 2000s. Right in that range, they were starting to do some oddball paint stuff. But yeah, we love that truck. We love that truck. Everybody fights to drive it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's been it's been fun. It's That's awesome. Truck. And then, what are some of the other projects you've got going right now? Um, well, um, I've got a, uh, an FJ40 uh, that I've had for 20 plus years, and we started using that for display and, and other things. And that's one of those unicorn vehicles that I was telling you about. I've had that. The longest it's got a now it's got a five seven uh, vortec in it and 37s and blah 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 it's a lot of fun that's my summer uh summer yeah. driver you know the midlife crisis little red convertible yeah 20 years ago um but the, the the one we're building right now is a 1983 uh fj60 fun uh, and it's a really clean really clean truck but you where did you where did you find that one at uh, a friend of mine in Salt Lake City was selling it. He found it. It was a Texas truck, and I'll, it'll make obvious sense in a second. It was a Texas truck that a gentleman bought for his wife. She wanted a Land Cruiser. She drove it once, and they parked it for five years. And so he picked it up and and you know, shined it up a little bit and did a couple of things. And then I took on the project uh, from there because I've always loved the 60s. But the drivetrain in it is the unique thing. It has a... Uh, Ford 351 Windsor race engine in it. Whoa! With a Dana uh, transfer uh, transmission and transfer case in in it. It's a four <laughs> 400 horse V8 in the 60 series, and it looks huh? stock. I mean, from wow. the outside you look at it, it just looks sounds like terrifying. Sounds terrifying. 
It sounds it's, like it sounds like that's like a really quick way to end up dead. Because <laughs> that that car does not stop or turn either. <laughs> It's fun. It's not going to go out, and I'm not going to drag race it. But it's fun. <laughs> sure, to have you that. are. Well, of course, maybe a little, <laughs> just a little bit. Not like the 200. We're not going to go lightning fast on the on this one. But it, it's fun. You get it, you load it up, and you pull up to somebody in their in their Mustang. You know, and they're like, and you hit their right next to it. They look at you like, what the hell was that? <laughs> it's fun. So we've been uh, keeping it pretty stock. We added a few a uh, few odds and bits to make sounds it look totally nice, but stock. It's stock. Totally stock, <laughs> not. Right? Yeah, just don't look under the hood. Uh, well, so that, that's kind of a fun track. The worst thing about the 60 is the engine. I mean, like, I'm not saying that it's not reliable and yeah, stout super, yeah, and going to run forever. Like, an incredible that's a tractor conversation. Engine. But it's an incredible tractor engine. It's yeah. an FJ40 <laughs> with a really nice body. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're slow. They're slow. But That was my first Land Cruiser was a 1983 FJ60. Really? Mm-hmm. Fun. That was my first Land Cruiser. I didn't own it for very long because it was just me driving, and I'm like, why do I need such a big car? So I found a guy up in Flagstaff that had a growing family and an FJ40, and by some like providence, like we were talking about earlier, like he needed a 60, and I wanted a 40, and we met up in up at uh, Lake Pleasant, and we drove each other's car, and we signed each other's titles over, and we both went home in the other vehicle. It was the craziest <laughs> exchange I've ever had in my life. Nice. We, there was no money exchange. They were worth basically the same amount of money, and he got a super clean grandpa-driven 1983 60, and I got a FG40. So awesome! Both yeah. good vehicles. Yeah, yeah great those, vehicles. Those are going to stick with me for a long time. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah no reason to change that one. The way the 60s that. look, they do look great. It's like it's classic. I haven't had a 200, and I haven't had a 60. Those are the only like two Land Cruisers I haven't. Oh, had. you had a hundred. Oh, and I haven't had a hundred. Okay, so this is all just crap. <laughs> I was thinking that it was like you need to pick first, up your Well, game. first I started saying, "Oh, it's the only one that I haven't had," and then I'm like, "The guy that swaps through cars hundred. like toilet paper, and and uh, you haven't had those. What's up with it? I don't know. I should fix it. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Got to wait for those containers. Because you had a you had an, <laughs> you had an eighty. You know how I, feel. I know exactly. You had an eighty very early in life. I right traded now. a I traded a uh, Land Rover Discovery for it. Oh, okay. Which was like my first car. And uh, at that time, I couldn't afford to fix the rusty exhaust on the 80 series. And uh, I remember driving it to Mall of America, and the brakes just, the lines just <laughs> burst on the highway. And I'm like, what the hell do I do? Uh, <laughs> what did you do? Uh, crimped them off, rebled them, and went to Mall of America. <laughs> <laughs> Made um, it there? I didn't need rear brakes. Yeah, totally overrated. Completely. I mean, I don't even know if you can notice the difference if an 80 series has rear brakes or not. not they don't really stop. They don't stop. <laughs> they don't stop. I love the 80s, That's though. The, the 80s they, are Yeah, they're like amazing. A, it just, the, the brakes is just something that I I've, tend I've, to take issue I've with. i closed the chapter on the 80 series. Yeah. yeah. That's right. But you, it was a nice chapter. Yeah. Awesome truck. Yeah, yours was amazing. Yeah. Was yeah, that cool. was a very cool project, Matt, for sure. One of the things we also like to ask, Paul, is books that you have come to love or maybe books that you've given to others many times because you, it's made such a difference for you. Uh, and it can be anything at all. What, like, what are some of your favorite reads as Paul May? I've been dreading this question. Okay. Is it Mad Magazine? That's how I would answer it. <laughs> it's pretty close, yeah, yeah. In, a, in a different vein, though. Yeah. Uh, uh, in, in high school, I tried to be deep. I thought I was going to be philosophical and, uh, you know, like Albert Camus and Heart yeah. of Darkness, and, you know, the whole uh, uh, Apocalypse Now kind of like. But what I liked about that, that was is somebody that went far deep into Africa and found himself, but that what he found was a godlike person taking over everything in its surroundings. Sure. Very interesting, deep I'm not a deep guy. I found that out after after reading some of that stuff. I was like, "Yeah, no." That's What's your me. favorite beer, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stay on the books for a okay. second. Um, then we can talk about your favorite some the, beer. Some of the things uh, uh, Crack Hours put out. Oh yeah, they're uh, great. Really, the into the deep or into the uh, thin into thin air and uh, into the wild. Yep. Both um, analogous to our lives here. Sure. As far as too much crowding in one area can be catastrophic if you're not taking care of things correctly or if you go too far in the deep by yourself and things can happen out of your control sometimes. Um, yeah, he's just such a, not only a wordsmith, but the a research that he does to paint a picture of a 
of something that in both cases were tragic. But, Very tragic situations, yeah. but it makes you think more. Right? Yeah. On, on preparation and making sure that you know, what you do is, is going to be okay. Yeah. I love those things. Um, now, this is going to sound really weird. Maybe not. Um, but I, I really like, um, I'm a Jimmy Buffett fan. Okay. He wrote a book called A Pirate Looks at 50, which is a play on a song of his. It was called Pirate Looks at 40. And it was a, um, an, a story in an autobiographical way. And it talks about him and where he started and what he did. And, and so I, I, I almost kind of like emulate that guy. I think he does an awesome job. He runs an incredible billion-dollar enterprise in bare feet. Yeah. Right? And it's, it, uh, Mario, our friend Mario has a, a great analogy of it. It's like a duck. You see a duck on the water, and it looks like it's just cruising and having, you know, just ease, handling life with ease. But you get down under the water, and those little, <laughs> those little legs are doing this the whole yeah, time, right? Sure, Correct, sure. And doing this constantly. But if you look at Jimmy Buffett on the outside, you think this guy is just this laid-back, hang-out, Hawaiian shirt, shorts, barefoot But he guy. has a billion-dollar empire of $500 margarita machines. Yeah. Yeah. And flies a seaplane and does incredible. You said a sportsmobile. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Yeah, Absolutely. He had a sportsmobile out on, on his uh, stuff back on the eastern coast. And he's been all over the planet. And he, he goes and explores tropical places and exotic places in Africa and all over the place. He's been everywhere. But he does it his way. Yeah. Right? And his way doesn't have shoes. And I can understand that completely. Yeah. I think I've seen you wear shoes a few times. I mean, I... I think maybe because we had to hike somewhere or whatever, but it's required. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But yeah, but I think yeah, so, yeah. Maybe if you went to Antarctica, you would put shoes on. Maybe maybe some socks. Some socks. <laughs> um, but, so I mean, do I hand out books? Am I am I that guy that does racist reading? No. I, I went to school, I went to grad school, and I gradually learned I didn't want to read any books anymore. I did enough of that. <laughs> yeah. So I listened to stuff. Um, you know. The military mystery thriller kind of stuff, you know, gets me across the thousand mile days. Yeah, I, cool. You know, so it's it's brain dead stuff. Uh, a lot of fun that way. But other than that, that's about no. It. It just I always find it fascinating what what people what they identify with in that way, right? Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah. a couple autobi autobiographies, autobiographies. Yeah, I said it right, didn't I? You did. Um, uh, Barack Obama's. Oh, a promised uh, land. Promised land. I thought that was pretty I haven't read that. Yeah, I haven't Great. read Great. I mean, it's a pioneer in a different yeah. way. Yeah, sure. Right? He had, he had a, a lot of upward uh, struggles. Sure. Uh, the other one that might sound kind of oddball is Matthew McConaughey. Oh, I've heard that that's McConaughey, great. excuse me. Oh, Matthew Green Ma Green Lights. Lights. I've, I've heard, heard it's great. Yeah. It great. is. It's, it, his life has been an adventure in its own right. And he was a, uh, a nomad. He bought a vehicle and he bought an old Airstream and he wandered the United States for a couple of years. And Interesting. Once in a while, he'd go back and make a film, and then he'd get back in the truck with his dog, and off he goes again. And yeah, he's wandered wonderful. the whole country. That sounds perfect. <laughs> yeah, because you just sounds like yeah, sounds like you in about three weeks. <laughs> yeah, you just, yeah, pretty you're close, about right? to pick up your first Airstream. Yeah, yeah, That's super exciting. excited about this. You can get your Margaritaville Margarita Blender in the Airstream, and you've got your dog, and you can go wander around the country around the country you yeah. can drive you, you're gonna, you you're drive gonna your be Ma matthew pretend, mcconaughey pretend that you're in a lincoln commercial uh, not as good looking uh, okay yeah, for I mean, one that's all up to interpretation right? to you it depends which movie he's in <laughs> <laughs> true he can look terrible if he wants to uh no but i i, I found it very uh, humorous uh it's not been an easy life for him uh some of it has some of it's not been but i, I took a lot away on being yourself mm. being true to what you want to be find your goal yeah. Live it. Yeah. Find a way of making that happen for yourself. And and that's what he's done. He's done a good job of doing that for himself. So. That's a great suggestion. Cool. Yeah. It's a it's a cool book. Okay, so now we gotta ask you about your favorite beer. Because I I remember in, in your historic home that you had downtown Salt Lake, mm -hmm. you had a beer fridge. Its only job mm -hmm. was to maintain the ideal temperature of I think a red stripe and there was something else in there. Frosty barley pops of all nature were in that, uh, <laughs> in that fridge, and it was a full size fridge. We had it had it in the garage, and I at any given time I would have a variety of somewhere between twenty five and thirty different beers from all over the world stuffed in that fridge. Uh, the new house has a beer fridge, it's just slightly smaller version of the of the original. Um, so favorite favorite beers, uh, my go to right now is a full sale amber. Okay, nice. Um, getting into the ambers more. Um, the IPAs, no interest whatsoever. Yeah. I Male don't. frappuccinos. 
something like that. Yeah. Um, anything like that makes, you know, these things right here in your neck, anything that makes those clinch, you yeah. shouldn't drink. And then yeah. you get cotton mouth afterwards when you have like an IPA. You're like, Oh, interesting. I, yeah, that's why I, I guess I've never even tried one. The, the so. IPA <laughs> thing's interesting, right? Because it was like, here, have this beer that tastes like dandelions. And then somebody was like, oh, I really like this. Totally lying. And then his friend <laughs> next to him was like, oh, yeah, I like that too. And then it became like a, <laughs> a thing. A thing. It became like a, I'm not going to admit that I don't like this. <laughs> At least that's, that's my opinion. That's what your opinion is. From the Pabst Blue Ribbon drinker. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it, maybe, it, maybe it's an, an acquired taste. I'm yeah, hope, it could be. I'm really hoping that's the case. And yeah. I have not acquired that. Yeah. And I'm fine with this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah Amber's, Amber's a great way to drink It's a great one. Yeah, or or pails or something. Yeah. In that IBU under 30. I'm good with that. Yeah. That's yeah. Just, just fine with me. So... Um, yeah, I got hooked on red stripes for a while. It was a I remember that. very dangerous sport. <laughs> um, Utah is known for some very interesting um, liquor laws. And so I, I knew exactly every entrance to the state of Utah on where to pick up the stash on the way back into I the gotcha. state. I got gotcha. you. One time coming back from, uh, from Nevada, we stopped by a uh, liquor store in Mesquite and I, uh, with the Chaser trailer. And we, I brought back it was like 10 or 12 cases of red stripe. <laughs> In the trailer, bootlegging red stripe. And <laughs> now I know why you bought a chaser trailer. It was your bootleg. So it was your easier because I could I could adjust the air pressure on the, on the <laughs> No suspension. one would ever know. It didn't, wasn't no, sagging or no, anything like that. No, it worked out great. So for a long time now, Utah's getting a little bit better on their whole process. And so it's not as bad. <laughs> Utah actually has some fantastic microbrews. They're kind of ahead of a lot of the rest of the country sure. because of their laws, if, the, if I remember that correctly. Yeah, yeah. They've done some incredible things to make... Uh, beers with not much alcohol in them taste yeah. really good <laughs> I, uh, I actually like that idea so, yeah like it's if called, i could get like it. a full-bodied beer that was only you know three percent or so yeah, you could just drink a lot more of them right? well i don't know if you're a fan of pacifico light but that is my baja beer of choice that's because i can sit beer. it's a maintenance <laughs> beer i can sit down with like a rack of it and then at the end i'm like yeah. I'm just, rehydrated. Yeah. <laughs> I feel slightly bloated, but totally hydrated. Yeah. <laughs> and not drunk yeah, at all. Yeah, you can drink those all day long. Yeah. Uh, so wh what's next for you, Paul? Where, where would you like to travel next? You've, you've got this Airstream that you're picking up. What, what's, your, what's your goals for travel over the next couple of years? Uh, with that in particular, we're going to do a lot of Americana. I'm really looking forward to, um, I'm kind of going the other way as far as, as people are like, are getting, like I got to get away from all the people and I got to, like, no, I'm going to go and see some things that, that are not in the way out. Uh, so yeah, we're going to, we're going to go do the uh, Smoky Mountains and we're doing a, a craft bourbon tour for a week and uh, seeing some of the countryside and uh, I'm going up into South Dakota and seeing some of the Americana stuff there. I'm That's hoping amazing. to cross uh, coast to coast Canada. I think it would be a lot of fun. I think that'd be great. Do the uh, Trans Canada Highway. Yeah, yeah, do the full thing. Uh, and my wife and I are fortunate enough now that where we are in our positions that we can work remotely, uh, for the most part. And so we're going to go and try that. We're even looking at uh, staying for a while, a few months at a time, remote. Um, if we can work it out, there's still some bugs to work out of that. Yeah, one. sure. But more of the Americana stuff and the vehicles that we're hauling this trailer around with are stand alone in their own, their own right. So if we find, you know, get a bug up our nose and we want to go, hey, let's go over there for a couple of days and climb this impressive, really hard technical thing. All right. You know, just yeah. unhook, the tra unhook the trailer. That's and the cool thing with the trailer is you can really just leave it. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So like the, 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 tra the trailer that we chose is light enough that we can haul it around with the 200. And we've got everything on that 200 that we can live on its own right. Sure. Yeah. Right. So it's like the base ship and the satellite, you know, X fighter cruiser. We can head out and and do our thing or the Millennium Falcon. As well. Yeah. That's as we right. talked about, just get away and we could go and do the really nasty stuff if we wanted to, not not have a problem. So looking forward to that adventure. So as we get close to the end here, I think yeah. that you should talk about why your Land Cruiser is called the Millennium Falcon. I thought that was really great. <laughs> so you have one you have one sticker on the vehicle, yeah, one little white cutout, and it's of a Millennium Falcon. And uh, what I, I, I liken it to is that it's a uh, large um, cargo vessel that's white with black highlights on it, and it's capable of going uh, like a bat out of hell. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what that six truck parsecs. Is. I've seen you drive Baja in six parsecs. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty dang close. <laughs> Not as fast as some of my friends, but I'm keeping up with them better and better. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. It's it's our little Millennium Falcon. You know, it does the job just right. I d- I do remember when you you came out to Prescott and you wanted to start doing some higher speed driving, and you you and I spent about an hour perfecting your Scandinavian flick in a two in a 100 series that was really fun that was a good day that was an awesome day my uh, my wife gave me a birthday present of uh, Scott Brady training one-on-one this is early early on yeah this is when I actually did training way back then right yeah. right back there but even before the overland training thing and and I wanted to learn to drift and it's not easy to dr- drift a fully kitted 100 mm-hmm. series all-wheel drive truck but we got it oh we did yeah we also proceeded to break an entire case of red stripe in my fridge <laughs> on one of those we were trying to teach me how to, to do speed bumps and we endoed into one of them yeah. And, yeah i had i spent three hours cleaning the fridge out of glass and then <laughs> about two gallons of red stripe <laughs> after that it was a sad day <laughs> but i got over it but yeah, one of the coolest highlights of my I to- life is I like totally, drifting that hundred i totally remember that i mean we we perfected it with heavy trail breaking so it was just like <laughs> last second of a of a turn monster brake application so left foot braking trail braking and the the rear end would lighten just enough and it would start to rotate and then i'm like paul full gas and he'd roll into full gas and it would just it would pitch around the whole corner it was beautiful and then right after we got that done he goes stop 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 and i'm like hit the brakes what 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 and he goes that was so awesome we were (laughs) high-fiving yeah that was a good time that was a great that was a great day that was really that was really a great day awesome how can people find out more about you and about what you do uh, so, uh, equipped one, uh, dot com is our website, equipped expedition outfitters. Uh, that has everything to do with our business and what we've got going on. You'll find all the vehicles that we have on there and, and a lot of the stories. Um, there's a Facebook page linked off of there, uh, Instagram off of there. Mm-hmm. Uh, my personal Facebook and Instagram are pretty darn boring. I'm, I'm kind of off the grid on that kind of stuff. So if you want to find me, just look up Paul May and you'll see my ugly mug in there somewhere. Mm. And, uh, X Overland did a nice piece on your truck not all that long ago, so I think you can find that on YouTube uh, on your 200 series. Yeah, in the shop is their their That's series right. that they did up in their thing, and we've been fortunate enough to work with them for a decade now. And I yeah. heard you mention the the plaque that you got from. Yeah, they they gave one to us too, and it's in our shop. Oh, they're amazing, um, amazing people. For those that are listening to the podcast, if you don't know about X Overland, make sure that you check them out on YouTube, and I think that they're also on. Amazon, Amazon Prime, uh, Prime, yeah, and they're they're running some of their uh, their their shows from a few years ago. We were, uh, equipped was their first sponsor. We we met them at one of your events out in California. Yeah, yeah, a very long long time ago. Yeah, yeah wonder wonderful ago. people. So, any any other questions you got, Matt, for for our man Paul? No. Yeah. Is it time for a beer yet? It's time for it a beer. Is, it is. That's my question. Is, <laughs> where's my beer? <laughs> In my truck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And on that note, ah. we thank you. We thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you next time.